So yes, I, I was an alumni, uh, and I did my bachelor's here. Um, and Scott gave a really generous introduction to, to what I've done afterwards. But I think what I would want to point out about, uh, about my time here is that you know, I learned the skills and techniques and methods of, of, of learning how to design architecture. But there's one thing, when I look back on my work, which I did in, to prepare for this lecture, I look back and I realize that it was here where I learned that as much as architecture is about providing an answer, providing a solution, it's also about asking questions. Um, and my work was really asking a lot of questions here. Uh, a lot of them, I, I can look back and say, not so successfully, but what was important was I was, try I was trying to develop a method on not just to ha how to ask questions, but actually how to figure out what are the right questions. Um, I'm in that picture somewhere. You wouldn't recognize me but uh, you recognize that space. So this is an example. This is the one project I'm going to show from when I was a student. Um, this would be a photography class. And as I mentioned, this process of asking questions, not everyone's going to get it. Not all your professors will get it. I don't necessarily get it now that I am a professor with certain students, but you really just need one professor. And that professor is going to be able to encourage you and to understand that what you're seeking is not necessarily any single question, but there are perhaps a set of questions that lead to other things down the road. So this was in my photography class. Uh, I was asked to take a picture of something that makes you think of the word desire. Um, so what I came up with was melting chocolate and smearing it all over my face in a kind of performance that would occur over time. Um, and you can, it, top left would be the first, bottom right would be the last. Um, <clears throat> and unbeknownst to me, and this is probably not one of the questions that I asked because it wasn't what I was interested in, unbeknownst to me, when you smear chocolate all over your face, you get um, really bad acne. <laughs> so that, that kind of lingered for a while. So um, jumping forward, um, uh, last year, my partner and I, we won the um, Rome Prize. And the Rome Prize is um, um, given by the American Academy in Rome. It's the oldest overseas research institution uh, that is American. It's, in, it's independent, um, which is a big quality of it that's important because you can, you, there are no strings attached. You can do whatever you want. You have um, uh, one year. Um, they provide you with, you know, a studio, an, apart an apartment, um, a stipend, one year to, what we did was one year to ask questions. And having practiced for now um, 15, 17 years, practice architecture, um, a lot of what I had done was provide answers. And what we, what we did is we took the opportunity of this year to ask questions about how we practice and how we teach, because we both teach. Um, and it was a kind of an incredible opportunity. This was our studio uh, for that year. Um, it, is this, it was a studio of a lot of architects that preceded us. It was a kind of common studio for, to give to the architects. Uh, I think Michael Graves was in the studio. Um, uh, a graduate of this program who won the Rome Prize, Katie Newell, I think she was in the studio as well. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it was in this time that we were asking these questions, and, and we didn't necessarily even know. In the beginning, it was very destabilizing. We were asking questions. We didn't know where they were going. Um, and you don't have deadlines. You don't have um, uh, clients. <laughs> you don't have any sort of deliverable. But we're just, we were just doing work. We're just producing work, asking questions. Some of them were really random questions that we thought were like, what was the weather like when Piranesi was in Rome, uh, in Baroque Rome? Um, some of them were you know, maybe more important questions, like where can we get the best porchetta sandwich? Um, but to back up a little bit, um, both Rickelli and I have taken circuitous paths, both to get to New York and then to Rome. Um, we didn't necessarily, you know, we, we come from um, two different places. Rickelli was born in Tel Aviv. I was born in Vietnam. Um, we're both immigrants, uh, and we're both um, coming from two very different climate types, which is an important part of our work, Rickelli from uh, tropical, wet and dry, I'm oh, sorry, I'm from tropical, wet and dry, Rickelli from arid. 
Um, but this climate map is not only about um, our different stories, but also mapping our weather experiences. And this forms a lot of our thinking in, in, in architecture. Um, and we see Rome as a similar kind of circuitous path, which is that we had to go to Rome in order to come back to New York and, and kind of approach practice and teaching uh, in a different way, um, kind of a reori reorienting our values and, and, and our priorities. Um, so this is, uh, you know, the underlay is, is uh, a climate map of the different climate types um, in the world. This obviously is changing rapidly, that it'll look different in 10 years, it'll look different again in 20 years. Um, but what, um, the problem with most of these climate maps is that they, like climate, is um, very abstract and difficult to really uh, get people to understand how it works. Um, weather is immediate and experienced. And so we like this map more. Um, this is a projected climate for, uh, in the EU for 2070, where cities that are um, in Northern Europe will have the climate of cities in the South. So Stockholm and Oslo will have the climate of, of uh, Northern Spain. And Istanbul and Rome will have the climate of North Africa. And this, from this map for us is really instrumental because it's for us the difference between climate and as something that occurs over a long time that's abstract and that as a result is easily politicized and weather, which is immediate. And you can't question the weather. You talk about the weather, you may um, uh, you know, disagree, uh, but it, everyone experiences it. And so it's a very specific reason why we approach weather because for us, it's a way to kind of reorient to the discussion about climate and eventually about climate change. So these temporal differences are um, you know, a way to rethink architecture's relationship to the environment. So I'm going to go through a series of very simple terms, which I think we all know, but these are terms that are important in our work and I think that um, what we, some of what we did in this past year is to question how we define these terms. They're really simple and you take them for granted, but um, <clears throat> their, their assumptions uh, are within them that we have been kind of investigating in the past year. So what makes us human? Um, it's really how we relate to others in society. And we, we, we interact together, we're, as humans, we're a socially dynamic entity, and we gather in groups, and also our bodies respond uh, thermodynamically to exterior uh, um, environmental conditions, to, to weather. So the human body is a thermodynamic system. We design for humans. Um, the relationship of thermal and social dynamics is an important part of work, and it's actually how we define the boundaries of our, uh, how we want to redefine the boundaries of architecture and cities. Nature, is not an assumed term for us, but it is a question. It's a question that um, our predefined definitions of nature, uh, we're kind of constantly asking questions for it. So in this photo, what is the nature? Where is the nature? It's, there's both visible and invisible nature, nature. Is it just the green plants that are growing on the concrete frame? Or is it the invisible air that's in between all of this matter, making the plants growth possible? Or is it the effects of weathering that you can see in the con concrete? We focus first on invisible natures because those are, those are the natures that make the visible natures possible. Um, and they're sensed through properties of air, thermal conditions, humidity, static electricity. In our times, it's becoming increasingly important to design for the collective. Collective is not the same as public for us. It's about fostering communities, and it's not about um, an association with, uh, let's say, municipal government or to um, uh, uh, larger stakeholders. Um, so designing for the collective is at the core of what we do. It is human nature to act collectively? This is a project that we did. Um, I won't show it in detail, it's been a while. Uh, we did it for Art Basel, Miami Beach, the Contemporary Art Fair. But um, this project was probably our first big break, big, big competition that we won. Um, and in it, we really started to develop this idea that architecture can be a mediator between natures and humans. And that what we're trying to do is reconnect collectives and collect collective 
um, collectivity um, with these invisible natures, such as the weather. The, um, the project was made of seven miles of rope hanging that would change and shift as, uh, each, each um, evening with uh, different weather conditions. Nature is not the other of architecture. We have an idea that we call interior urbanism that redraws the boundaries between indoor, outdoor, and between the city and the room. Architecture can never fully separate from nature's, um, and it, specifically for us, fully separate from the weather, um, despite the best promises or the best intentions of the, of the modern project. Nature is also not a single state. There are always multiple natures, both visible and invisible, occurring simultaneously. We prefer to call it natures, uh, which architecture mediates and adapts to. We have a cross-disciplinary office at Modu. Um, we work with a lot of different collaborators um, beyond the kind of typical collaborators that, of an architecture discipline, you, you know, beyond your structural engineers and your um, um, different code consultants. So, you know, in the past, we've worked with scientists and artists, um, ranging from a marine biologist to a robotics engineer, from a music composer to an interactive media artist. And I'm gonna show some of these projects. Humans and natures can coexist in new collectives. Architecture that's permeable to weather, that is simultaneously both urban and interior, can foster new kinds, these new kinds of collectives. So how we define collective is, I think, important. We design to foster this collectivity, um, which is not necessarily the same as working in public space. Collective space can occur in public space, but for us, collective space highlights or foregrounds um, people and, and humans, which is who, we're, who ultimately is our client. So like weather, the behavior of people is inherently unpredictable. And we're always trying to harness this unpredictability that we're designing active environments and programs that mediate and basically um, almost celebrate the, the unpredictability of, of architecture in an environment. Um, and a lot of what we do is actually designed for a certain amount of incompletion. So the idea of incompletion for us is that a project we don't design for its final state, we design for maybe a few steps back, and the project is only complete after um, it is uh, inhabited by humans and natures. Collective experiences link humankind to natural environments. So I think that these three um, sentences are uh, kind of core, core values um, in terms of how we think and how we, how we work, um, some of which have been, you know, has been developing over years and some of it is more recent um, during our work in Rome. So I'm going to show um, projects uh, some of them from before, some of them uh, before we went to Rome, some were done in Rome. None of it is not chronological, but organized by these themes and these questions that we're um, trying to ask. Um, and in a way also to see the work that we did before going to Rome um, as a way, you know, you, the work in Rome can, can almost reframe the work that we did before. Always prepared for technical difficulties. So um, this is the view from our studio. Um, and we were fascinated by this constantly changing Roman sky when we first, first came there. Um, and it was actually our first memory, kind of weather memory from there. Um, so we recorded the sky for a month, every day, two hour time clips. We we're probably the only people who would wake up and be happy to see clouds. Um, clouds, speaking of clouds, clouds were first classified in the early 1800s by Luke Howard, who was the fa father of modern meteorology, and um, first to identify the urban heat island effect. Weather was at that time typically only thought of as a picturesque image. His classification system introduced both space and time into weather. In Italy, or in Italian, the word for weather is tempo. Tempo is the same as time. Uh, similarly, our time-lapse videos show that weather changes over time, that there's invisible characters that are only visible when you see it in this way, that uh, air pollution or wind speed, visibility, 
um, no, ordinarily not, not experienced. Um, so these are the kind of, uh, in a way, it was a conceptual sketch of like how otherwise invisible characteristics of weather um, can be uh, can be experienced by um, how you how you render it, how you how you draw it. Okay. So. One thing to look at with those videos is the difference between the air and the atmosphere, the upper portion, the top third, and the air and the biosphere, the, the, the white line that's the, um, the line just above the city, uh, and the difference in air quality between the two. So <clears throat> this is the color values of the atmosphere that's reflected um, in um, the kind of weather report, uh, daily weather report. This is the color value of the biosphere. This is air pollution. Um, reflect, these are literally just color sampling off those photos um, that I, or the videos that I, that I showed you. But both of these um, drawings, we would say, that are part of an understanding of weather. This is the average sky. This is taking the color values of the weather, averaging them to get an R, a constant RG value. This is climate. This is what you experience, over, in this case, over the period of a month. So understanding this difference between weather and climate and that which is um, physically experienced and that which is understood is, uh, you know, I think, is an important part of our, of our work. This is what you rarely, you, what you can't see, but what, let's say, is, is experienced. So we continued, and we said that the question of how to represent weather and climate is not a new one. Um, architects and artists have been addressing this for a very long time, and we started to see it in other things. We saw it in the um, very well-known Piranesi's views of Rome, which I probably saw the first ones here <laughs> in Betty Dowling's class. Does she teach anymore? Um, so I still distinctly remember seeing these drawings here. Um, and what we did was we, uh, one of the incredible things about the academy is they get you access to things that no one typically can get access to. So we got uh, uh, access into the, uh, what's called the L'Instituto Centrale per la Grafica. It's the, the drawing and engraving archives of the Ministry of Culture. Um, so I'm probably not supposed to show you this. They have a thousand copper plates of the original copper plates of Piranesi. Um, this is a close-up. They never let people, you can, get, you can get access to photos of the coppers, and we saw them in person, and we handled them, but um, they, for some reason, don't want people to see the close-up. But what's interesting about this is you see how much kind of physical work is done into, in making this copper. And what we learned as we accessed the archive was that the drawings, the views of Rome, were not static drawings. They were temporal drawings. They were drawn over a period of 20 years. The first 80 views of Rome were modified for a period of 20 years. And of those 80, um, we, have the, we, we got access to the list of what's called the states. So he would modify the coppers over time, and then they would record the changes that were made in the states. So what we found was that the vast majority of the changes were not to the architecture. The majority of the changes were either to the sky or to the ground, to the light or to the shadow. And this to us was really fascinating, which led to these drawings, which are a drawing that takes a complete drawing and makes it incomplete, a, an act of subtraction in order to focus on what we think is an important part of our, our understanding of the drawing, which is that there are two atmospheres happening here. There's a, a, the, the upper atmosphere that he, as he goes back and he adds, um, if you remember the drawing I show, or the image I show of the copper plate, he's going in and basically um, with, a, with a wider tool deepening or making darker um, the, 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 the lines of the sky, adding a kind of drama to them. Or he would go back in and change the shadows on the ground. Um, so these two atmospheres, one is meteorological, the other is uh, experiential, is, is, is about human experience. Those are the two atmospheres that he was primarily working on. And that for us was really a kind of uh, important moment in our work in understanding that um, controlling those two atmospheres is perhaps where our work lies. 
So, as in Rome, um, we did a project that um, also, this is before, we did this project before Rome, but we did a project that also highlights the everyday experience of the sky and of air quality. This is in Beijing. It's a project for the um, uh, Olympic Park uh, that you see, um, the very well-known Herzog and Dumouran Stadium. Um, and we were interested in the smog. It's very well documented, the issues of air quality in, um, in Beijing and in many of the large Chinese cities. And what we were trying to do is highlight um, an experience of a city that appears and disappears. So when we, when, we, when we went there for our site visits, we would wake up one morning and you would see you know, a building across the street. You wake up the next morning and if the air quality is worse, that building's gone. And this, 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 this idea of a city that appeared and disappeared was really important to our understanding of, um, of how Beijing works as, as, you know, on an urban scale. So for us, we translated it into this concept of the city in the room and the room in the city. So what we're trying to do was um, create a kind of um, outdoor room uh, with a very large window in the sky that would focus on the Olympic um, landmarks that were appearing and disappearing, kind of calling attention to their visibility. Um, this is uh, the view from within. That's the Olympic, um, I think it's the, the, essentially the media uh, building, media tower, TV and um, all of the internet media for the Olympic Games. And um, where you can see we're set within a very large public space. From within here, you could see the, the Herzog and Dumouran building. And this is um, uh, on a day of good visibility. One thing, because we work a lot with weather, um, we kind of, we're forced to live our philosophy. Whenever we go to document our projects, they never, the weather is never as we designed for. So when we were um, trying to photograph the project, they had unprecedented beautiful skies for two weeks straight. Um, and we finally got that, which is actually still not the worst condition, but it gives you a sense of what, what um, the project um, more or less looked like in, in most conditions. Um, so it's part of a very large uh, uh, public space um, in, in the Olympic Park is massive and what we said was we're going to put insert something that maybe would change the context of how you um, see or view um, the spaces around it, a kind of uh, almost like a viewing device. Um, and so it's, it's neither uh, fully open or uh, fully enclosed. It's kind of something in between. And uh, what we did was that we, we specified a, a material that was both, uh, it's, it's a kind of fabric type of, a tensile fabric that's both um, um, reflective and translucent. So this image you can see, it takes on, um, because of its, this quality, it takes on some of the color of the, of the, of the air around it, um, whiter, during, whiter during nicer days, and it becomes more yellowish um, during, during the days of poor air quality. This was a competition proposal that we did for an extension connecting two museums uh, by Alvaro which have two very different collections. Uh, one is a museum of uh, central Finland arts, and the other is actually the museum for Alvaro Aalto. Um, and what we did was, you know, I wanted to show this is that not in all of our work, we're adjusting to specific climate types. This is northern Finland. It doesn't make sense to um, do a building that's partially open or, or fully open. Um, so it's, a, it's, you know, it's a fully enclosed structure. It is, you know, in, in the traditional sense, it is a building. But what we're still doing is trying to um, render the invisible uh, atmosphere. Um, and we're interested in this, this gradient sky conditions that you get in that part of the world. Um, there's a result of very unique atmospheric conditions um, and extremes between winter and summer, as well as conditions that you've probably heard of, the, the northern lights. But in, during dusk and during, suns, um, during sunrise, these kind of gradient skies are very pronounced. Um, so our strategy also kind of um, evoking Alto is, was to work on a strategy of a skylight. But rather than multiple skylights, there was just one skylight. Um, it faced east from the morning light. And you can see the skylight. It's a single cut um, in the roof. Um, that, uh, on the, that's an eastern facing morning skylight. And then um, a kind of curved glass wall that's west and south. So the idea was that the ceiling would receive simultaneously light, um, kind of warmish 
light uh, f uh, in the morning um, and um, the beginning of <coughs> cooler light that happens later in the day. Um, and, and this surface is an architectural surface that we thought would kind of render um, the, the, that, that atmosphere. Um, we also develop ideas for facades, um, one of which was a kind of tube system of glass, which you can kind of see there. Um, basically glass tubes that would work well for the extreme climate for a kind of uh, insulation system um, and uh, also kind of alternate um, visibility, uh, clear visibility and more refracted visibility. Humans. Um, as I mentioned, the human body is a thermodynamic system. In buildings, there's also an exchange of heat energy, which you um, should know from your, <laughs> from your courses, um, from higher temperature to lower temperature, invisibly occurring in the air. The human body benefits as both a thermal and socially dynamic system. The relationship of thermodynamics and social dynamics in collective space, especially in, um, in urban space, is one that can activate uh, social interactions. Uh, group interaction, strange, maybe not like you know strangers holding hands, but um, it's it's a kind of it's a relationship that I think we um, have been interested in very recently. One of our first Im uh, impressions coming to Rome was in the piazzas. Um, they fascinated us. There are five or six, or actually maybe even more names for Italian piazzas: piazza, piazzale, um, largo, campo. Um, uh, they all have both, they have, they, um, it took me a while, it took me, you know, six months to, to finally get an answer, but they, the different names have to do not only with size, um, which would be the obvious um, kind of explanation, but also with architectural character. Is it more open? Is it more closed? And I thought that, we thought that was really fascinating, that the, the degree in which it feels more like an open urban space or more like a kind of um, outdoor room changes its name. And for us, that was the beginning of a series of drawings um, uh, where we would do these walks uh, through piazzas. You never experience a piazza in central Rome singly. It's always a series of piazzas interconnected together as a kind of network. Um, and within these piazzas, we would take photography, thermal, thermal photography. Um, so the obvious one on the top is, is the uh, heat transfers that happen um, as the sun tracks across a uh, piazza. Um, on the bottom, that's a cobblestone. Um, those uh, Roman cobblestones are very dangerous for, for ankles, um, I would know. Um, a cobblestone out of the street. And um, the, the difference between um, the temperature of it being out of the street versus in the street, or here, the heat transfer that happens on that uh, metal panel um, transferring from, um, uh, from, the, from, the, from the steel to the stone. So we took um, uh, these walks uh, and, and composited together thermal photography and translated into what we call <coughs> thermodynamic drawings. Um, and these are drawings that are, that are 10 feet long and they're generated from the photography, um, transformed to show exchanges, thermodynamic exchanges between um, material and people. In the winter time, people cluster in groups according to the sun patterns. And in the summer, they cluster in the shade. And in these drawings, what we're trying to, to get at is that people in city, the, the people in the city are together um, when they're in the same temperature range. So uh, another kind of walk where um, from morning to afternoon, the groups are formed as the sun tracks across a, a plaza. Strangers who don't, do not know each other are close enough to be perceived as together. This project is um, cloud, called Cloud Seeding. Um, it's another project that has to do with this idea of thermodynamics and social dynamics um, and uh, how they um, interrelate in a plaza. And the pavilion was first designed to activate a hot, unused plaza. Um, it was a competition brief. The, the museum in the bottom part, that's called the Design Museum Holon, done by an, uh, Ron Arad, the uh, Israeli-British um, um, architect. This site is um, uh, just outside of Tel Aviv. This is their National Design Museum. And the museum and the city started a project where they wanted to figure out how to, um, let's say, um, activate or, or take advantage of, of underutilized or, or neglected um, urban plazas. 
So um, our project um, took this brief and kind of asked a set of questions about what are the variables that change. And obviously sun is changing, but another variable that's changing is wind. Um, and these are some of the wind roses that in the Mediterranean, uh, in this part of the world, the wind changes from the morning to the afternoon, changing direction as it comes off the, the Mediterranean Sea. So what we did was we um, had a, um, uh, basically a kind of very um, lightweight structure that held balls, that's what you're seeing here, um, 30,000 balls that would move with the wind, um, creating a kind of flat landscape in the air and changing from day to day and from morning to afternoon, um, basically a kind of moving um, uh, sh shadows that are not just the, the result of, of uh, the sun, but also of, of wind. So these are some of the um, images that you're seeing that, you know, this is, again, I, I spoke about it before, but this unpredictability, I think, is an important part. Um, unpredictability that leads to a kind of design language of incomplete is an important part of how we um, think about design. So it's a steel structure, a very simple one. We borrowed from a kind of vernacular language of the greenhouse. Israel is, um, they have kind of pioneers in um, growing, um, growing uh, fruits and vegetables in a very extreme climate. And when you drive around Israel, you see uh, fields and fields of, of greenhouses. We removed the wall panels and the roof panel and um, installed, in, installed instead a, a, a ceiling panel, which is made of a, a architectural mesh, very, very, lightweight and thin that um, water and wind can pass through, um, but allows for a kind of totally dead flat surface to, um, to move. You know, when you do these projects and you're not, you know, in the place and you're communicating, we had a local architect, the biggest concern we had about construction was whether, how, whether they could install it totally dead flat because the slightest amount of uh, angle would shift all the balls into, into one corner. Um, so during the day, it would, could move, it would move from one side to the other. So this is thermodynamics for us, thermodynamics activating social dynamics, that the different thermal conditions created by the shade would activate how people use it. Um, and there were different uh, events that the, both the city and the museum organized. There was a um, free, th th that was when there was, um, they had removed all the furniture to get ready for an event. Um, <clears throat> but there were public performances. Um, there was a kind of outdoor yoga classes. Um, the Media Tech Museum had a, uh, had a, had a, a kind of free loan library. Um, and or just you know kind of like a shade structure for for um, um, a shade sorry a shade structure for just kids to play ball so one thing that we do is when we're designing is we ask these questions about like which we have a lot of interest in program um, and, and questioning what, how you define program. So one of the things is, is about saying like, if we are not designing a story for a fixed program, the program given to us, if we think about this as perhaps a bookstore and that we can design for conditions, thermal conditions rather than programmatic conditions, how would it look like and what would it be? Um, so these are kind of speculative drawings that we do um, sometimes, uh, you know, during the process or after the process. Um, <clears throat> the next project is uh, one that is from Rome um, that we kind of developed over a year. Uh, one of the things that they say, uh, it was, it's, it's most closely related to the actual proposal we had uh, for the Rome Prize when we applied. Uh, and one of the things they say, because the Rome Prize, there's no deliverables, there's no, um, any, not, no requirements, um, you very rarely do people uh, do the project they apply for because the city itself and the experience of being there changes your perspective drastically. And so for us, this, this was what we called the long burn project. We did a series of short burns. This is the long burn. 
Um, and at first, you know, at first we thought we weren't, we weren't going to do the project we proposed, but eventually this kind of evolved and, and it became the, the, the 12, a 12 month long uh, inquiry. But we use it as a kind of sounding board to test a lot of these ideas, these questions we're having about natures and humans and, and, and the collective, um, and, and the possibility of this socialization of a kind of what, what we call weather rooms. So this is a map of um, incomplete projects in Italy. Italy has over 600 incomplete uh, structures, publicly funded. Um, that doesn't count the thousands of private um, uh, incomplete projects. They have a Ministry of the Incomplete, which I've always thought was an amazing title for a job search title. It's a job that I had wanted. Um, so um, the incomplete for us are, are modern ruins. So they are found spaces, they're urban leftovers without a future, but rather than focus on this quality of the incomplete, we looked at them also as weather rooms, kind of laboratories, uh, to, in which our idea of indoor cities, interior weather, th thermal and social dy dynamic mixes come together. And rather than concentrate on them as failures, we wanted to see them as opportunities. And they raise questions about in architecture, about the discipline of architecture, about the whole idea of, in, of completion. Um, in, you know, in, in these kind of unstable societies, and that in the times we live in, what exactly, when is a project ever really complete? Um, there's changing climate, changing programs, changing sites, changing clients, all these things. Um, in a way, we're constantly working in some form of incompletion as architects. This is um, a project that uh, is outside of Rome. It's called Città della Sport. It is a um, very, very large natatorium um, that they spent um, about 270 million euros on. Uh, construction stopped in 2012. Uh, and there is still, um, you know, they try to come up with ideas on how, what to do with it, but um, it would take apparently another 400 million euros to complete it um, by, and this is by an architect who, um, let's say, has, has perhaps a track record of this, <laughs> this Calatrava project. Um, and what we, this is a, we did a lot of video when we were in Rome. What we were doing is to try to re-see this failure as opportunity in that there's an opportunity of seeing it as hybrid environments that combine indoor and outdoor conditions. So this could be seen as an indoor rain. A new kind of weather room. A Roman fountain. An open enclosure. Dry pools. Panoramic window. An artificial mountain. A monument without a city. And yes, we came to Rome with a drone. <laughs> a new Colosseum. cloud machine. An air quality barometer. These are views from the, um, actually from the American Academy uh, of the um, building appearing and disappearing 
um, depending on air quality and humidity conditions. <coughs> okay. Um, so for decades, Italy has forecasted the incomplete. Um, it is a, a condition that existed going back to 50 years um, post-war uh, in Italy. Um, but in a strange way, it has predicted what would happen in the past 10 years in, as a result of the global economic crisis. These are some of the ghost cities that you see in China. Or looking very similar, the African new towns, um, also uh, uh, structures that may be physically completed, completed but not occupied. And that this kind of definition of incompletion is uh, one in which um, is mo more nuanced and maybe more based on um, a kind of temporal definition. This is uh, um, the incomplete in, in southern Europe. You know, you can't drive through in Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, in Greece without seeing sites like this. Uh, in Greece, they, uh, they call it um, uh, uh, rebar in waiting. Um, and, and a lot of it is actually, there's a lot of different drivers for it, and I can, that would be a whole other lecture. But um, let's, let's say that it's, there's, also, there's a kind of culture that is um, accepted because of, uh, I think that in a way it, it becomes so prevalent, um, and it's kind of everywhere. And what, what we uh, said was that, you know, it's a really interesting thing to think about Italy as the future in this way, that it, it forecasted this. So what can we say um, as, as architects? What can we do? Um, and also kind of learning from very unique conditions uh, in Italy, um, its climate, its architectural history of adaptability uh, to indoor, outdoor conditions, and its history of public space um, offers perhaps a, a kind of a, a way forward. So. This is a, one incomplete project. We ended up designing a kind of, uh, developing a kind of design initiative about developing a set of strategies for incomplete. We used this particular project as a, as a way to um, uh, test the ideas. Um, this is San Cristoforo train station uh, outside of Milan, um, uh, where uh, it's a really interesting site because it's set within a field and um, there's a kind of continuity, a natural field, uh, continuity between the field and the, and the structure and that the field has qualities of interiority um, in the same way that the incomplete building is kind of experienced as a, a, an urban space. And that reading of the project and reading of a lot of the incomplete projects is really what, how we kind of generated our, our design from it, which is that um, these things simultaneously exist as landscape, urban and architectural scales. So the train station itself, um, which is here, you can kind of see those, those scales coming together. Um, the train station was originally designed by Aldo Rossi um, for the national rail system. The construction stopped in 1993, I believe. Um, and it was intended as part of a national um, master plan to redefine re train uh, train transport in Italy, um, and the, the National Rail eventually uh, canceled that project, which ended up uh, canceling the, the, the canceling the national project, which canceled the construction for this this particular train station. Um, so it sits there. Um, but we were interested that we were confronted with an incomplete Autorossi, an architect fascinated with ruins, and here we have a, a ruin of a Rossi building. Um, so. The task for us was um, how do we kind of take some of the intentions of Rossi um, and reinterpret them um, through the lens of um, the incomplete, um, in a way stripping bare um, some of the, the early um, principles of, of postmodernism, which I think is a really, right now, currently, what's, if you've seen some of what's hap what, what are the images coming out of the Chicago Biennale, um, is, a, I think, a relevant question. Um, so this is interesting in that Rossi was very much interested in collective memory, collective memory of ruins. But the incomplete has no memory. There was never any occupation as a, a program or a function. It, it, it differs from an abandoned structure in that there is the lack of memory. So we are looking at defining um, collective memory and also atmospheres, which I think Rossi was also interested in atmospheres in a, in a different way. Atmospheres for us are, are grounded, I think, in, in science, um, science and, and then eventually technology. 
um, that uh, our atmospheres are about temperature and humidity and, and static electricity and you know, the, the, the different kind of materials that we think we, we work with. Um, so as a result, our definition of the collective, I think, is different. You know? So the collective memory for Rossi would be this kind of um, shared, um, uh, sh shared understanding of, of, uh, of, of architectural language that as, as, a, as a group of, of, of uh, as a society, we all innately know. <clears throat> and it's the role of the architect to kind of intuit this somehow. And for us, the collective is a much more literal definition. We're literally speaking about collective not as a kind of singular vision shared, but actually a collective made up of many different voices in a kind of city within a city. So similarly with atmosphere, our definition of atmosphere is a literal one. It's, a, it's one based on science um, in that we, we looked at the um, uh, thermal, uh, we look at it not necessarily as a, as a ruin with a memory, but actually just as a site. It's like any other site that you go to that has properties to, to it that you need to understand. And this particular site comes with a certain amount of mass, and that mass has thermal specificity. So in this particular climate, in the summertime, you can get um, uh, full shading from the floor slabs, the concrete floor slabs that have thermal mass. There's no facades, so um, it's fully ventilated. Um, and it's actually really quite comfortable to go to these sites. <clears throat> in this part of the world, in the wintertime, the sun comes in very low. And this is actually a, a, um, a solar radiation um, analysis for winter. It comes in very low. So if you are in the, during the, in the path of the sun, it's actually quite warm, which is why when you're in Italy, um, in the wintertime, people eat outside. So this thermal massive structure um, what we did was we said, we're not going to complete it. It's not about completing the projects, but in some way, um, accentuating its incompleteness. Um, it's surrounded by a metal mesh, kind of like an aviary uh, mesh, that would serve as a railing and also as a growing surface. Uh, these weather rooms that we're designing for capitalizes on both the thermal and the social character of this particular site. So it's... Um, Platform is not a public space because it's not operated by any public institution. It's a collective space that is run by the people who use it. It's located in the city's periphery where incomplete structures tend to be in Italy and also in a lot of southern Europe. Um, it's, uh, in, in the periphery, you also have a kind of lack of quality spaces for people to gather as well as a very high, currently a very high unemployment rate. So the idea is that we're creating new, trying to create new overlaps between work and learning. It's an open air building for future work, a collective urban space for learning skills and sharing knowledge. This is the workshop line. So these are a series of elements that we desi designed, each with a certain thermal and, so and social, socially dynamic character. Um, this houses open workspaces that can be used as design studios, incubators, or catering kitchens. Um, radiant heating occurs in the ceiling. It is shared with the areas uh, around it, um, which we call the learning plaza. The learning plaza is um, basically where workshops happen. So you, the idea is you go here, you would use the space, you can use the facility to work, but it, in exchange you need to also teach. So you're teaching the skills that you have and you would also learn skills from other, uh, you know, other people using, using the facilities. So it's kind of an exchange and sharing of knowledge. Because this is the, um, uh, what we call the, the room of doors, um, and it provides different scales of spaces as well as um, openness and closeness to the environment. Um, you know, the boundaries between work and learning, I think, are increasingly diffuse. Um, it's no longer that you go to university to, to learn, you spend your four years here, you go out, you work. Um, increasingly, what's happening is that you are constantly learning as you're working. And I think that's the, the kind of social change that we are trying to pick up on in the project. These are the multi-stages. They're um, basically bleachers that would change uh, in the, um, change in their configuration. Um, the, what we did was we said that the, the stair cores, um, there's a lot more stair cores than needed for this kind of building, so we 
and proposed removing them and filling them with what we call the Tower of Air. Um, and the Tower of Air is, says that rather than trying to heat and cool a semi-exterior space, which would be an enormous waste of energy, the, uh, the Tower of Air basically says you go up to these, to these spaces, there's furniture that is radiantly heated. So you're heating, the, f the chair you sit on is heated, similar to a car. Um, so you heat your body rather than the heat the, the air around your body. So the workers of today, independent consultants, internal freelancers, startup employees, and the work that they perform, the contract work, the micro jobs, the work for equity, demands new places for work and, and sharing knowledge. So it's a strategy, it's a, I would say that, you know, not to see it as a, as a necessarily a project, but as a kind of design initiative that we are <coughs> launching and speaking to different um, organizations about how to um, not only think about new overlaps of work and learning, but also how to capitalize on um, underutilized spaces. So this project was a project we developed for a client um, <coughs> who had a who, was, who wanted to take over this uh, shipbuilding facility. Um, and it's a kind of contemporary ruin as well. The, the main hall, it, would build, it was used to build yachts. The main hall was um, uh, the size of the Tate Modern Turbine Hall. Um, but his company um, basically created uh, sustainable uh, architectural um, panels, let's say. Uh, and those panels had very strict dust requirements. So a space like this is really not ideal. So what we said was that the, you know, in order, the, 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 if you ask a mechanical engineer, they would tell you the diagram on the left, which is um, a kind of concentric diagram, uh, a, a kind of air quality version of the thermal onion. Um, the outermost is most dirty, the innermost is your clean room. Uh, but this is not very good for programs and for interaction of people. So um, we developed a kind of intersecting thermal onion. <coughs> These diagrams are um, lexicons that we draw. We do this, we rarely, this is not something we show to a client, but it's an internal document um, where we are designing um, kind of hybrid conditions between architecture and the environment. So uh, an air corridor or a wall of air. These are some of the, let's say, um, um, systems that we that we develop as we design projects. Um, so the, the idea with the project is that there would be um, rather than that one large volume, three volumes, each one parallel. And each one can be subdivided into different conditions of uh, heating and cooling as well as air quality. And this would change depending on how they're used. And a big requirement of the client was visibility. One of the programs he asked for was a kind of um, event space. So he didn't want it to be, he wanted people to experience the kind of full scale of this uh, turbine hall. So what we did was to propose um, uh, what, we, what we call walls of air. And they're essentially very large um, uh, air curtains. The same thing that you would have walking into a grocery store, but at a massive scale, the, the scale of walls. And um, the, the idea, the experience of this is actually that you would be moving almost in the same way that you may move around in the city at the urban scale and experience different temperature ranges. You would have the same effect on the inside. Um, so the outer, the outermost is, is least um, uh, climatized, and as you go in, it gets warmer or cooler depending on whether it's winter or summer. So it's a kind of strategy of adaptability, I think, um, as well as uh, programmatic um, flexibility. So this site was damaged a lot um, during Hurricane Sandy. So what we proposed for the, um, the, the existing boat dock, um, the boat loading dock, which is a foot of, con a foot of concrete, very thick, uh, that w would be prohibitively expensive to remove, was we cut troughs through it, because um, it all slopes toward the water. So um, capturing that water and putting it into the, in the and putting money towards a, the island that we call the garden island in the center. So under that would be a cistern capturing the rainwater, and that island would basically be a kind of space for um, the people who work there to, to, to gather. So jumping around, back to Rome. 
This is um, a very well-known map. This is the Noli map, um, drawn at the same time and also partially in collaboration with Peronisi. This is uh, um, a, a, the first planimetric uh, recording of Rome. Um, he spent uh, 12 years surveying the city, recording and, and measuring and recording every single building and street in the city. Um, so we, this was also part of the archive that we were doing research in. And you know, this is the kind of very well-known depiction of a city in terms of figure ground. But what we're interested in is a character that is more than figure ground. I mean, this is a figure ground drawing, but there's a kind of invisible, uh, invisible set of information that's, that's within there. And what is really interesting about this drawing is that it's not really public-private as we know it. There's um, uh, churches, which are kind of quasi-public uh, space. There's the porticos of palaces that its um, understanding of the city between public and private uh, much more nuanced than contemporary Rome, meaning that there were gradients between what is fully public and fully <coughs> private. And as people would walk around the city, they would experience these. So it's actually a social, a social map as much as it is a, a kind of um, urban map, it's so, a map of sociability. Um, that, that was um, how we approach the drawing, and we kind of redrew um, that a certain portion of, of this. This is in Trastevere. I redrew it in, in terms of that kind of social map meant that there was also different thermal conditions. So the inside of churches are cooler. The porticos of palaces are shaded. So this is a kind of um, sketch drawing in which we were trying to show that in actuality the, the Baroque Rome was a lot more, um, let's say, thermally and socially mixed than uh, contemporary Rome. Um, so these drawings were kind of, the two sets of drawings you're looking at were done in, in parallel. Uh, one is an analog to the other. So this is, um, I think this is uh, the last project. This is uh, an, an exhibit that we did in the Academy. Um, and these are some of the collaborators that we worked with, um, which a list of it almost sounds like a, a joke about um, a composer, historian, two writers, and a physicist walking into a bar. Um, and it was a kind of incredible collaboration, um, which really harnessed, harnessed the, 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 what, what life was like at the Academy. Um, this was the, a performance um, on the opening night um, uh, for the exhibit. It's a single piece of paper that's 40 feet long. Um, imagine when you're working on a model and you really don't want to make a mistake. <laughs> Imagine that on 40 feet. No, nothing, no single piece of paper, no, no single amount of paper is added or removed. It's all cut and folded from this single long sheet of paper. Um, cut through a digital, uh, we use a digital plotter. Um, and what we call it is the indoor city. So it's our idea of a city where the opposite scales of the built environment, the urban and the interior combine together. And it's an idea that we've been developing over the year, which is that architecture perhaps is not a middle scale, but it's actually a place in which these two scales come together, in which they collide together, in which you have um, these kinds of spaces that can come, uh, that can come uh, you know, uh, appear. The wall of air, a rain floor, an outdoor room, a roof pond, air corridor, and the last one is not a space, but is an important part of the project, which is the carbon emissions from all of the other um, elements. So the city varies density to mutate architecture and the environment, as well as defining what is outdoors and indoors. So you're seeing two layers there. The bottom layer is red as the interior spaces, and the top is the exterior. And you start to see things that start moving, programmatic elements that are moving between one and the other, depending on uh, the density in which those elements are at. So as they, those elements that are, that are cut and folded, as they are um, uh, closer together, we read them as interior spaces. And th that's the, the, the drawing on the, on the model, that's what it shows. And as they start coming apart, you read them as urban spaces. So along the same drawing are multiple drawings at, at different scales. And you can see that here, these are just the drawings from, that were on the model, and the scale changes that happen depending on where they are in the model. Um, so thus the, the kind of idea of an in interior urbanism. 
something that combines exterior elements such as weather with interior programs. So this collaboration that we did, um, I'll show a video uh, just to kind of preface it. The, the video is mostly taken from the, the opening night, which there was a performance. Um, and the performance was readings by um, two uh, writers, uh, the two writer fellows and a historian fellow, uh, who were reading excerpts from the books that they were working on. And the excerpts had something to do with the environment in the city. And then the, you're going to start to hear the voices kind of mutate. And that's the work of a, a kind of sound installation that we worked with um, a music composer uh, who uh, basically took those voices and he identified within the voice little snippets, little kind of ticks in the voice that he would, tra he would transform into an environmental sound. So words uh, that were spoken about the environment would become sounds such as ice cracking or water drops. And it was a kind of interesting, um, really fascinating for us collaboration because we were also dealing with elements that were um, in some way uh, transforming from architecture to environment, from sounds to, from words to sounds, a kind of degrading of language. So the, um, the funny little black uh, objects are carbon um, ice molds. And uh, they, we worked with a climate scientist who is at the Earth Institute at, at Columbia. And in this collaboration, what, we were, what he would give us was um, data sets on the amount of uh, carbon emitted into the air, basically one of the prime um, contributors to, to air air pollution, uh, carbon emitted into the air as a result of the amount of construction, amount of enclosure. So more surfaces that are architectural produce more carbon emissions. So um, these little carbon ice um, models were deposited onto the, onto the project over the period of a month. So the exhibit was up for a month, and they would melt. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> though it was winter time in, in Rome, it's warm. They melt and basically degrade the model. They kind of destroy your own model which um, as an architect is not the easiest thing to watch. But when you choose to do a paper model outside, that's, you kind of celebrate the, the fact that it's, it's possible. Um, and uh, you, it, eventually, the, over the period of the month, these, the, all the carbon ice models would connect together. And you could, you could read, depending on whether a space is more urban or is more interior, you could read the amount of carbon emitted into the air uh, over time. So this is not meant to tell you to ask questions, but just to remind you the importance of asking questions <laughs> in your own work. Um, I think that I'm going to also show one last video since, because um, none of this shows anything to do with teaching. Um, uh, you know, I teach at Columbia, I teach advanced studios and seminars, 
This is actually not Columbia. This is at a university called University of Technology, Sydney, where I've been going uh, every year for two years. Now, now I'm about to do the third year. I go and teach a two-week workshop on carbon fiber structures. And um, I'm interested in it because much of the work that we do with weather, it's the enclosure that's, that, that's the thing that changes and moves. And because it's, it's just easier, obviously, to make um, <clears throat> essentially you know, the, the, a wall or a ceiling um, adapt and change. But the promise of carbon fiber, which has the, um, maybe let's just start it. Carbon fiber has the highest strength to weight ratio of any material, structural material. Um, allows us to explore this question and, and to, to ask, what if you have uh, structures that are weather adaptable, structures that can um, flex in a way. So um, structures not designed to resist, but to actually kind of flex with um, and, and move with uh, wind forces or structural, structural load. So this is done with a group of students. Um, each year when, when I go, it's like 10 or 12 students. And uh, it, we're fortunate in that you know, this university funds the carbon fiber, which is not cheap. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any questions? So that's produced in a two week workshop? Yes. Cool. It's working in a collective. <laughs> it's a very intense process. The first three days, each day, um, it's groups, so, so it's 20 people or so, three or four students per group. They put to, they, um, after three days, they pitch their project. And then as a group, they, we choose one project, and we spend the next 10 days prototyping. You know, it's, it's a material that really you have to get an understanding of how it behaves. So there's a lot of uh, testing and prototyping and building small-scale models, large-scale models, and then eventually build one uh, complete um, uh, final, essentially, in installation. And, you know, in, because it's Australia, there's uh, barbecue and beer, which is a good way to finish a project. Um, yeah, that's a $10 million question. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, if, if before we, we said that we are going to focus on weather as a way to rethink climate and, and let's say, uh, sustainability or environmental design, we did this for a kind of five-year period. Um, which, allow, as I said, allow, allows to go outside of the topic in order to come back with a different perspective. We are now, I think, in the point where we're saying we have a very um, strong set of uh, ideas and, and values about this issue that we want to address more directly climate change, um, you know, working, also working with um, organizations that would be willing to, to take on some of these questions. So, I think that one of the big one of the big issues for us is doing work that um, rather than waiting for clients to come to us, we we're trying to do the work that we can show to clients, potential clients. How would you say your work compares with that of Ned? To who? 
Netcon. I don't know. I don't know his work. Oh, I, I think I know. Yeah, I think I know who you're referring to. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't know his work well enough to, to necessarily compare, but I think that one thing that we do that, let's say, there's this other architects who are working in this, within, within this space is a focus on the kind of social um, that's important and also a focus on how to translate it into architectural ideas, um, into uh, larger, larger scale. Ideas and for us, the installations are a form of built research. So we're testing ideas that then we want to implement at, at building scale. Um, and if I think I know who you're talking about. His, he's an artist, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think I've seen some some of his work. Um, I, th I think the interaction there is is more as a as a as a facade, right? Um, and for we're trying to do things that are a little bit more um, Im immersive. <laughs> I was interested to know what other, I mean, you talked a lot about like shade and, and social interaction and how shade would bring, but like what about, uh, have you explored other climate conditions or other weather conditions like uh, social interactions and rain or, or snow, ice, like cold climates? E, um... We have, we, we have explored, let's say we've explored other materials, not necessarily, it, when we deal with temperature, there's just a lot more flexibility in temperate climates. But um, when I say we explore the materials, I'm not talking about steel and concrete and glass, but other properties of air. So besides temperature, we've worked with humidity. We did a project where we worked with static electricity and we used um, static, we basically tried to create a, a it was an installation where we made a, a big giant plotter, robotic plotter that would draw with static uh, electric ions onto a wall surface and then we would drop um, dust, <laughs> this kind of crazy project, dust, uh, dust that would either attract or be repelled by the static electricity ion. So it's kind of like creating drawings out of static electricity and dust, essentially. What about, um, what is it about temperate climates that makes it more applicable to the I wouldn't say it's more applicable. Temperate climates, you can, you, can, you can have more of this condition of um, in-between, outdoor and indoor. But like, for example, you know, the project that we did in um, the competition for Northern Finland, there we're translating the ideas into a kind of interior atmosphere that you can, can make a connection between what's outside and what's inside. Um, we have done, you know, like New York, and areas like New York, uh, Washington DC, they are some of the most difficult climates to work in because they are very hot in the summertime and very cool in the wintertime. Um, so in those, in those climates, we're not using the same strategies. We're not always trying to make a, connect, a li literal physical connection, but maybe one based on technology, for example, um, where you can, uh, it, we did a, a competition proposal for a museum in Washington, D.C. that had a very large kind of um, skylight surface that we use, um, let's say, d digital technologies to basically translate the each day's weather into a kind of color. So the, the coloring of the space would shift subtly uh, depending on the, the weather outside. So I think that there's different, different strategies depending on where, where it is. We're, we don't want to say that, you know, we think the architecture should be just fully open to the climate, but I think that it can be more open in a smart way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, I think that at that time in Columbia, there was a, there was a lot of people speaking about uh, adaptability and, and kind of programmatic flexibility, um, which is perhaps part of the reason why I went to go work for Bernard Schumi in the, in the late 90s. Um, it, it was, let's say, it's, it's in the air, um, and it's a, it's a topic that we're always very careful about because it has such a long architectural history and, um, and also an architectural history that has at times not been so successful. So we're, we're, we're careful when, we, in, when and how we deploy those strategies. Thank you, and, uh, Mike. Was, you know, I remember the first websites that you made years ago that had all the plus signs. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's really been great watching your career evolve and to see um, such care put into how it's represented. It's very nice to Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Do you still eat chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> That was a mistake that um, <laughs> I won't forget, let's say. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me.